Um, and yeah, I, I, I will be talking about some of the progress in distributional RL and hopefully connections with planning. Although in hindsight, I feel like you might view this more as planning adjacent, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll be able to make some interesting connections nonetheless. A lot of the work I'll be talking about actually isn't mine, but uh, I'll be bringing, as, as you said, uh, my perspective on it. For the work that I was involved in though, uh, the credit really more belongs to some subset of the people on this screen. And in particular, I really wanna highlight uh, and thank the, the work from Mark Bellmere at, at Google Brain, uh, Claire Lyle, who's a PhD student at Oxford and has done some really nice uh, theoretical work around distribution RL, and Mark Rowland, who's also at DeepMind, who's also worked on, pretty heavily on the theoretical analysis of distributional uh, reinforcement learning. So kind of coalescing the, the things I've observed um, over the past few years uh, trying to work in this area, it comes to a kind of a, a strange conclusion, which is that distributional reinforcement learning in, in the reinforcement learning community has been useful largely due to side effects uh, from learning the distribution, not so much from learning the distribution of returns as such. And as, a, as an example of, of this kind of effect, I'm going to look at some deep RL agents here um, plotted in, in terms of their performance over time on the Atari 57 uh, benchmark. And I will confess that this is pretty heavily weighted towards uh, work done at DeepMind with only a, a handful of, of examples from outside of that. Sorry for that. But um, the thing that I'd like to emphasize here is actually if you look at the green dots, which are non-distributional RL, kind of traditional uh, deep RL advancements, they really come from either network architecture improvements or algorithmic improvements. Um, whereas if I point at these blue dots, which are all advancements in the distributional RL sense, uh, with a couple of key exceptions, uh, Rainbow and C51 IDS are, are nice exceptions to this. These improvements are really due to just changing how we parameterize the distribution. And there was no a priori way to expect that one parameterization would lead to improvements in performance over another. So I would argue that these improvements are really almost a side effect and not the main effect. Um, and because of that, it's worth asking whether or not distributional RL actually has any real use or relevance to uh, the planning community. And I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, we'll, we'll agree that, that there is at least the potential for some useful uh, collaboration or, or information sharing here. The overall layout of the talk that I'm, I'm focused on here is I'll do a little bit of an introduction into distributional RL and, and expand on what I was just talking about just a little bit and then move into the learning side of things where I'll, I'll briefly mention some interesting theoretical results and connections with representation learning before I hopefully get to the areas where uh, the, you guys will be most interested and talk about these kind of planning adjacent uh, areas where distributional RL might be uh, important. And I'll finish with uh, this little asterisk point, which is not a, uh, research result, but a, a research proposal uh, where I'm going to try to take some of these lessons and, and suggest interesting research directions. And okay, so first of all, distributional reinforcement learning is set in Markov decision process formalism. That's where we're going to for our assumptions. And that's how we frame the problem when we're thinking about distributional RL. But I fully recognize uh, that MDPs are just one of many settings in which planning can take place. And that for a lot of people at ICAPS, it's probably among the least interesting setting. Um, so I'm sorry for that. But I do still think that there are ways of detaching from the MDP, MDP formalism and taking away interesting uh, insights and intuitions, such as the fact that in moving from RL to distributional RL, what we're really talking about is moving from an expected value problem to a distribution estimation problem, 
right? And that this opens up new challenges, which are not specific to MDPs that, that are general in this type of move, and new opportunities to use that additional information in new ways. Now, like I said, going back to the MDP and as such the reward maximization, what we're really focused about on in this talk is the return. And this return as a sum of discounted rewards is stochastic, it's a random variable. And that randomness comes from many sources. First, it, it may come from the agent's own behavior. If the agent's acting uh, stochastically or its behavior's changing over time, it can also come directly from the stochasticity of the environment, uh, maybe the most obvious source. And, and maybe less intuitively, it can also come from the nature of the function approximation that the agent uh, that intermediates between the agent and the environment. And in general, what we would want in a standard RL setting would just to be averaging all of this uncertainty, all of this randomness out and focus just on the mean, the, the expected value, because that's what we need for acting in, in the traditional sense. Uh, even if we don't want to learn a value function, we are really going to be moving our policy, at least in terms of maximize the expected future return. Whereas in the distributional RL case, we're estimating a return distribution, right? Con conditioned on the states or the states and actions. Even if we may, in the risk neutral setting, still be optimizing our policy towards the expected value, the central thing that we're kind of studying and focused on learning is this distribution. And while we could estimate our distribution fairly naively, so here I've got a, a toy example of a uh, kind of a tree MDP, and what we care about is estimating the return distribution at the root node. And at the leaf nodes there, we, we have some distribution over rewards. And so we could, of course, roll out in this tree, getting samples, and with enough samples, have a fairly decent estimate of the return distribution at the root node. But that's, that's crazy if we're in an MDP where the Markov property allows us to say, well, let's instead estimate the return distribution at these intermediate states. And if that's the case, if we know those estimates, then we can throw away all the future uh, returns and just use the estimates through something like a Bellman equation to compute our estimate of the return distribution at the state we care about. So that's in general what we'll be talking about is a distributional Bellman equation. And in the literature, this comes in a, a number of forms and these are the two most common. Um, and so I just wanna talk through what they mean and, and maybe what some of this weird notation is because I think it's a bit distracting and the actual ideas are really simple. So in the random variable form of the uh, distributional Bellman equation, it's appealing, let me go back to this one real quick, at the top there, it's very appealing because it, it's so much, so similar visually to the standard uh, mean value Bellman equation. It's also appealing because it, it, it has this almost generative or procedural feel to it. We're going to sample each of these, we're going to sample from each of these uh, random variables, right? The, we're going to get an instantiated reward, an instantiated next state from the, the transition kernel, uh, sample from our policy. And at the end of all of this conditional sampling, we can take those actual values, add them up to get our estimate of the new bootstrapped return. And that, that is a fairly straightforward procedure that should be familiar to most people doing RL. Um, but there's some complication here. And, and the complication is that the random variable version hides behind it this, this kind of difficult detail, which is that there are many, many possible random variables that have the same distribution, which is why when we talk about a Bellman equation in the random variable form, we have to include this little D to say these two random variables are equal in their distribution. There's we don't know if those random variables are equivalent as deterministic functions mapping probability space, but we know that their distribution is the same. And this is a detail that makes some of the theoretical analysis pretty hairy. So when we're doing that, we often end up using a different form, which is this measure theoretic form. And there's two kind of notational things I just want to highlight here. This one can be very natural if we view the distribution of returns as an object an object that we're going to operate on in some 
in some way. So here we have the push forward measure operating on our return distribution eta. And this is doing what the standard Bellman equation does for a single uh, sample trajectory, which is to say, it's going to take that distribution and scale it by this discount factor, which in, in practical terms just means that all of the support, all the values in that distribution are going to be scaled by the discount without necessarily changing the probabilities. And then it's going to, if the reward is a distribution, as, as we're assuming it to be, it's going to do a convolution with that reward distribution and the discounted distribution from the next state. And that's all that this kind of ugly notation is really saying to do. And then the second one is this thing that looks like I'm saying compute an average, but really what I'm trying to say to do is compute a mixture distribution. I don't want you to collapse the distribution down to a, a single scalar just yet. Um, this is saying in expectation over the next states and actions you might see, weight their return distributions by those probabilities. So just compute a mixture distribution over your next states and actions. And, and with that, we're almost ready to, to start talking about actual progress, but there's one big kind of concern that, that I think we have to pay attention to. And that's the very different kind of space that these two problems live in. That is to say, when we're estimating the mean of the returns, we're living in, in the space of a single real value. And, and this is a wonderful space to, to, to work in. When we're trying to learn the distribution of returns, we are in this painfully infinite dimensional space. And, and this, is, um, this is problematic. And to highlight why it's problematic, let's consider a setting that's much more familiar probably, but has a very analogous kind of difficulty. And that is the state space. So consider a fairly small discrete uh, state space, like in the case of this four rooms domain on the left. Here, we, we don't need to worry too much about approximation in the states, right? We can use a tabular representation and compute things fairly exactly. Whereas if we find ourselves in a continuous or uh, infinite, uh, infinite state space, like in mountain car, or even if the state space is just so large that we can't possibly hope to represent it uh, compactly, then we need to do some sort of function approximation that's going to have the effect of aliasing states together. Whereas in the nicer case of the, of the small tabular world, there's no aliasing required. And that's very much similar to what we're going to face when we move from the mean value RL to a distributional RL setting. We are going to need to choose some parameterization of the distribution much like we would otherwise have to choose some parameterization of the state space, which is to say a function approximator. So with that in mind, we might look at some of these parameterizations that have kind of been the hallmarks of the progress in distributional RL so far. And there's quite a few, and I've kind of broken them up into a few categories that I'll try to go through rather quickly. Um, the details obviously are in the papers that I'll, I'll mention, uh, and I, I just want to give you the high level intuitions of things as we go, uh, because to really get into the details would take you know, a talk per, per method probably. But first, let's think about learning the moments. This is really straightforward and probably the most studied type of setting where we're just, instead of just learning the mean, let's learn the mean and the variance or the mean and the variance and the skew. And we can keep on adding moments if we really feel the, the need to. And this particular update for, for the two comes from this Morimura uh, paper in 2012, where they do a natural gradient update of these, of these distribution parameters. But maybe we're not satisfied with the expressibility of, of just a unimodal distribution. So we can maybe expand that. And in this setting, we would say, we have chosen a categorical representation of the distribution, which means that we we fix the support of the distribution. It is a fixed finite support in the real line. And we're going to learn or estimate the probabilities that we assign to each of those points in the real line. So our distribution here is a, is a weighted, is a mixture of Dirac's where the location of those Dirac's is fixed, but the probabilities or the weightings is the thing that we're going to learn. And this is the, the, the approach that we, uh, Mark Bellamere and, and I and Remy Munoz did in our ICML paper in 2017. It's also what is behind Rainbow and the D4PG agent. It's 
a very simple, straightforward way, and it's, it's very appealing if you're willing to pay the cost of defining the support ahead of time. But if you're not, we could flip this problem around and define a different way of parameterizing the distribution. So the categorical approach can be seen as actually uh, approximating the cumulative distribution function I'm um, showing here on the left with a step function, right? So there's this nice smooth uh, cumulative distribution function of the return distribution. We're going to fix the locations and approximate the height of this little step function to approximate that distribution. And that's, that's what gives us categorical distribution RL. But we could of course do the reverse. Instead of doing this step function approximation for the CDF, we could do it for the inverse CDF, which is also called the quantile function. And that's what I'm expressing here on the right. As the name would suggest, quantile functions can be estimated at a certain point using a method called quantile regression. So here, instead of a fixed support in the real line, our fixed support becomes in the pro is in the probability threshold space, while our estimation is in where to put those Dirac's. So quantile regression, really cool technique that, that we should all be more familiar with, but it's essentially an absolute value loss that gets weighted asymmetrically. So you essentially are tilting it in one direction or another. The overweighted side of this versus the underweighted will determine where in the quantile function this estimator is converging to. Um, and there's a lot of work in, in um, economics on, on this particular regressor. So let's then move to another thing. And what's interesting about this one is that I just described to you a parameterization where our probability is fixed and our support is being learned. And we learn that support with quantile regression. Here is a very recent paper uh, doing what they call MMD distributional RL. And they use the exact same parameterization, right? Uniform weights, learning the points, but they're no longer quantiles. We'll, we'll call them particles just to, to have a, a general catch-all for this. Um, but despite having the same parameterization, you see you can actually minimize different probability metrics and get very different types of estimators. So this is a different way of approximating the distribution, uh, even if the kind of low level uh, way in which it's parameterized is the same, it's a different loss. And because of that, we get different interpretations of what's being learned. And then the final one I wanted to just mention very briefly is this very big class of implicit generative models. So the most famous kind of group in this would be things like you train an adversarial generative network, right? So uh, there has been work on doing this for distributional reinforcement learning, things like uh, Bellman GAN. Um, however, another one which retains some of the semantics would be uh, our method implicit quantile networks, which attempts to learn the full quantile function by making the neural network dependent not only on the state, but as well taking as input this tau value, which defines the point in the quantile function it wants to evaluate. And with this, or with any kind of implicit generative model, you can then just sample from the model fairly arbitrarily. The downside is you can't query the probability of any one event. So, I, I didn't want to go into too much of those details because what I wanted to get to is later in the talk. And so I want you to be able to take away some interesting things about parameterization of distributions for distributional RL. So in the first case of a fixed support and learning the probabilities, here are the things that you should keep in mind. It's very unclear how to choose the support locations in a domain agnostic way because returns vary so dramatically between different different problems. But there's also an advantage here that if you want to, it allows you a lot more control over the range of values that it can learn. Another kind of downside is that it tends to overestimate variance, which I can talk about maybe offline, but it's based on the fact that you're estimating probability at this finite set of points and eventually that probability must be split. Um, in the other side of things, in the case where the support is being learned, but the probabilities are fixed, like in quantile regression or maximum mean discrepancy. Um, quantile regression has many fewer hyperparameters. We don't need to set the support locations and we don't need to choose a kernel. 
So that's, that's fantastic, but there's a learning rate difficulty, which means that we almost always want to use something like an atom optimizer when training this type of thing, because of uh, the, the fact that very extreme quantiles see very little signal for most of their time, because the probability, I mean, by definition, the probability of anything being above or below them when they're extremes is vanishingly small at times. On the MMD case, again, we have a bit more of a hyperparameter problem here where we need to choose the kernel. And then finally, kind of generally speaking, as a, as a general trend, what we've seen is that as the uh, parameterization becomes richer, able to capture a larger class of distributions, the performance of the RL agent seems to be improving. And this pattern has persisted over a few years now, and it doesn't, it's not clear why that should be true in any way. Um, so that's a surprising thing, but has, has been fairly robust so far. So now I'm going to drop into learning before we go to planning. And, and the, the point being is there's a lot of different ways that you could parameterize the distribution. And one of the natural ways you might try to choose amongst them is regarding the theory. The theory might tell us when something makes sense and is sane to do. And so the first question I might ask is, is this even going to converge? And that's an important question. So one way of doing that is to look at contraction. But unlike or less or more seriously than in the standard mean value uh, case for RL, contraction requires some additional information, which is to say, what do you mean? Like what in what distance metric are you talking about contraction? This is sort of also true, obviously, in, in the RL case. But in the distributional case, we need to say, how do we compare two distributions? And so this is important because as an example, in this paper I mentioned where we did categorical distributional RL, um, we proved that the distributional Bellman operator is a contraction in the Wasserstein metric, which is great, except for the algorithm that we actually proposed did not minimize the Wasserstein metric. So there's a bit of a problem. And it was only until about a year later when Mark Rowland was able to prove that the, the algorithm that we did propose minimizes the Cromer uh, probability metric, and that this is in fact a, a, that the distributional Bellman operator is actually a contraction in the Cromer. So there's this lag between theory. And another nice example is this very recent paper on MMD uh, DQN, where they, they showed some very nice empirical performance, and they proved uh, that the distributional Bellman operator is a contraction in the MMD distance, but, but only for a select space of kernels. And this set of kernels is not necessarily the ones that they wanted to use. So it will remain for future theory, like another, another roll in paper type of result uh, to show that, oh, actually, no, we can expand the set of kernels. And so using theory to choose which, which parameterization we, we make is very backward looking. It takes time. Um, the other bit of theory that you might want to think about is how much approximation error accrues over time. And there's something interesting here, but I'm going to be fairly brief, which is that the moments of the distribution are the only things that don't accrue any approximation error in, in a very specific sense that like I can using only the moments fully do a Bellman update that accurately estimates the moments with no loss of information, no, no additional assumptions necessary. And that's really, really powerful. Uh, th there's a slight copy out there, convex combinations, also good. Uh, but CDRL, QDRL, no other known method has this property. So we can look at those, those approximation uh, bounds, but in general, again, it's going to lag the empirical results pretty significantly. So what about those empirical results? Well, we, we can see that when we run these, these algorithms on, let's say, moderately large scale problems, that they do perform very differently. On the left, I'm showing a variety of these, rainbow, IQN, QR, and prioritized in DQN as, as relevant points. And on the right, we have like a categorical one added to a actor critic agent. And, and so we can sort of judge this, but it's, it begs a different question as well, which is, why are any of these improving reinforcement learning performance? And why would one parameterization have a better effect than another? It's not entirely clear why. So I don't have all the answers to that. 
uh, that's active area of research, but I do have a nice thought experiment that might help us uh, tease apart some possible hypothesis. And I call it the bird dog task. So in this task, you as the agent um, really enjoy visiting this pet store to, to spend time with dogs and birds. So every day you go into the pet store and you decide whether you want to pet the dogs or look at the birds. And this pet store owner is unfortunately not amazing because with 50% probability, they have actually uh, acquired a really mean dog, which is going to give you some negative reward. But on the other hand, 50% probability, that's a, it's a very nice puppy and, and you get a lot of plus three reward. On the other hand, if you choose to visit the birds, uh, same probabilities that this is a mean bird versus a, a happy bird, but because it's in the cage, there's not so much of a difference. And so in either case, we're gonna receive a plus one reward. I know you see where I'm going with this. Um, down the line, the task is gonna change and the pet store owner is going to realize they should stop buying angry dogs and angry birds and their policy will switch so that they only show you happy, wonderful dogs with that plus three reward and, and friendly, chirping birds with that plus one reward. And the key thing here that distinguishes the average value RL versus the distributional RL is that while learning in task one, standard RL isn't going to learn anything. Obviously, I mean, this is a contrived problem, but it's not going to learn anything during this time in task one because these values are not, there's no difference. So who cares whether dogs are better than birds or, or vice versa? Um, the distributional agent, though, spends that time learning something about the environment. It spends that time shaping its representation to be able to predict these possible future values. And when the task does change, the thought experiment at least would go that the distributional RL agent would have learned a representation that allows it to more quickly transfer to predict the values of this new task after learning the first task whereas the standard RL agent has to start from scratch. So we did this experiment. We used CIFAR 10 for images of birds and dogs. When I show you a plot of, of errors in a second, I'm showing you test error. The training error was, uh, the training was done separately. And, and the actual result is pretty similar to what, you, what I just told you you should expect, which is that the distributional uh, agent because it was learning something important about the, the structure of the world, actually is able to transfer this and, and learn on the new task much, much more quickly. Now, you might be arguing at this point that maybe all it learned was some low level visual features and, and that's a super reasonable uh, question. And so we did actually try to ablate this where in the second task now, instead of dogs and birds, it now has to, see, you know, it's choosing between going to see an airplane or going to see a ship. We sort of have broken the metaphor a little bit, but the point being, if all it was learning was visual features, this, this uh, would probably have still have a fairly significant improvement due to distribution RL, whereas if it was learning something more about the structure of return in that representation, that it should have much less of an impact. And of course, that's what we see. There is still a little bit, so I, I would argue there is some visual feature learning there, but there's something much more important going on as well. So now we get to go to the fun stuff, uh, the planning and, and planning adjacent topics. So I'll talk about two papers here that I think are really interesting and related. First one is search on the replay buffer, which I imagine quite a few of you are familiar with, and an optimistic perspective on offline RL, which is nice because it also ties in with some of the discussion from yesterday about offline RL and potential uh, relevance to planning. So search on the replay buffer very pr briefly and very abstractly is populating a replay buffer that contains state action next state information, but it's also learning it's learning a value function that's goal dependent. So uh, if I go forward a slide real quick and you look at the pseudocode on the left, the value function they're learning is in fact a uh, state goal value function. Actually uh, in the real details, I think it's an action value function and they're just maxing over actions on the pseudocode, but details there aren't super important. What is important is that they build a graph out of the replay buffer by connecting these states together based on their estimated uh, distance, which is to say the negative value that they've learned in terms of how far apart they are. 
And then they simply do uh, some fairly straightforward planning in order to have a nice uh, solution to the, the, the goal that they've been asked to solve. Now, what's interesting from a distributional RL standpoint is their choice about how to actually learn this distance value function. They make a point of saying that they used this categorical distributional RL for two reasons. First, you get some sample uh, efficiency improvements. That's, that's cool, but I think it was a minor point for them, and it's certainly a minor point here. Um, but what it allows you to do is have a much, uh, much more robustness um, in this estimation problem. We know that the values won't drop below zero. We know that if we allow them to go unboundedly towards large values, that this, this can drag up our estimates of the lower values and make all of this very, very difficult to estimate accurately. Uh, there's a paper about estimating values at over many orders of magnitude that Heidel van Hessel did that, that was talking about this. And the reality of the situation is that representing this, even for the purposes of collapsing it back down to a mean in this categorical distributional way, is extremely effective at this type of problem. Um, so what they do is they cap it between zero and some maximum. Three is just an example. In practice, they used a fairly large number. And anything over that number is just many. It's like infinite goes there. Um, so first, a toy problem, four rooms. And here, what we're showing in blue in the middle thing is we're showing the probability of success. Um, the default one is just trying to directly act using that uh, goal conditioned action value function, and, and that drops off fairly quickly. But the actual search on the replay buffer using that and the search and the planning actually performs quite well. They have some nice examples where following that default policy looks basically like it just goes in a straight line. Whereas when you plan, you actually do achieve the goals along the way. And then they move to a, a, a richer uh, planning environment where, where they're trying to move around, navigate around in this virtual apartment. And, and there's a lot of interesting results, comparison to related work, but, but because I'm talking about distributional RL, I'm gonna focus on the thing most relevant to that question, which is their ablation, where they tried to replace the categorical distribution with just a, a standard value function and saw the performance drop down below random. And, and there's, it makes sense. Uh, if, if the distances are very large, uh, you know, or nearly unreachable, this can really destroy your ability to estimate distances everywhere else because a mean is, is the combination of all of these values, it's gonna drag it all over the place. So that's, that's one interesting result. The next one is this optimistic perspective. So this is just this simple offline RL setting where they train a DQN agent on an Atari game online as you would normally do it. But, but while they're doing that, they feed all of the generated data, all of the transitions in the frames, all 200 million of them and their actions into this large data set. And after it's done, they train with some offline RL algorithm on this fixed data set. And I'd say that that way because the offline RL algorithms, as Alan was pointing out, is, are actually just online RL algorithms. So for example, they train with offline DQN, which is to say just DQN on this very large fixed data set. And they see that performance degrades very substantially uh, compared to the online DQN agent. Now, the interesting thing for us maybe is when they train this with an offline QR DQN, again, the data was generated with a DQN. It performs much, much better actually than the online DQN with, with some obvious exceptions down here on the left. It doesn't know how to do Montezuma's Revenge. Um, so what's going on here? Well, arguably based on the online results, we might think that it's learning a representation that allows it to deal with, with this offline problem a little bit better. But to be honest, I don't know what the exact connection is. It just, to me, seems like there is a clear connection between the improved performance in the online RL case and this improved robustness in the offline case. And the authors seem to agree. So what they did is they actually used the same as I would call it, parameterization as QRDQN to provide a new algorithm that isn't learning a distribution over returns. Instead, it's more like a random mixture of ensembles where they have multiple value estimates and every time they need a, an action value estimate, instead of kind of averaging them naively or taking one, they choose a random convex combination of them 
And there you go, there's your, and so every time it's trained, it's trained with a different random mixture. And they found that this plus the kind of network structure uh, matching QRDQN was able to achieve very similar and sometimes better um, offline RL performance. Even both of these agents were actually quite good with even small fractions of the training data uh, that the online DQN agent saw. So there's a couple of interesting results here. So basically that robustness can be improved by distribution RL, but it's not necessarily tied to the distribution. It's tied to what it's doing to the representation. And we still need to figure out what that is. And the other one being that the categorical distribution offers us some control where we can, you know, we can encourage certain structure in the, in the learning problem to avoid problems with stability. Okay, so now I'll, I'll talk about risk sensitivity. And I think this is a, an area that there is a lot of overlap with RL and planning is the need for the desire for the ability to plan or act uh, in, in a way that's sensitive to the possible risks of the outcomes that might happen. And um, this is also an area where it seems very difficult to do this in a way that doesn't involve learning some parameterization of the distribution of future returns, with the one exception that if you have a fixed risk profile and it's never going to change, then you can probably still apply a standard RL method. So the two papers I'll talk about very quickly are Quantile QT Opt for risk aware vision based robotic grasping and worst case policy gradients. So QT Opt was a fairly successful um, robotics grasping paper. And what they did here is really fairly straightforward in this plot is they just replaced the value function with a return distribution. And in red, uh, sorry, orange, this is just doing quantile regression. And in blue, this is doing uh, that implicit quantile networks, which is just the implicit generative model approach. And, and fitting with what I told you before, uh, fortunately, uh, the more expressive distribution parameterization does tend to perform better, at least early on before they tie. But this isn't the interesting result in this paper. The interesting result is related to risk sensitivity and what they did next. So they, they actually, because we have a distribution, we can, we can distort it. And there's in fact these class of risk metrics called distortion risk metrics, which literally distort the probability space in order to give you a risk averse or risk seeking um, evaluation and thus a policy. So they considered these different ones um, and I'm trying to show you what these different ones do in, in effect of changing this risk neutral distribution. But what you can understand it to be doing is when these parameters are negative, what they're doing is they're sampling preferentially towards the low end of the distribution. And when they're more positive, they tend to sample preferentially towards the high end of the distribution, that is to say more optimistically. And this allows them to give these different risk evaluations. And what they found is that learning in simulation, there was a small benefit to being risk averse. That's, that's interesting all on its own, but it's a relatively small bonus. But when they transferred the learning from simulation to execute on a real robot, then there was a much more significant benefit to acting in a risk averse way relative to a risk neutral or especially a, a risk seeking behavior with a kind of amusing result that they found that the risk neutral and risk seeking behaviors broke their fingers with much higher frequency than the risk averse counterparts which is just to say that in this type of slightly out of domain, uh, out of training domain transfer setting, being risk averse was helping their, their, their agent fairly significantly. So the next one is the worst case policy gradients. I'm gonna go through this one a little fast because I'm running short on time. Learn a distribution, train your actor, your policy uh, with CVAR, which allows you to do a, a risk averse policy. This is interesting because in this driving simulation that they do, the, the other drivers on the road, you can't know how they're going to drive. They are very unknown and random to you, as you should know. And in this unprotected left turn, what they find is that the learned distribution correctly estimates that the risk involved in this turn is increasing as the car is getting closer and closer. And, and they evaluate in a very similar kind of setting where they perturb the, the simulation environment after training to make it 
different, right, in some fundamental way, changing speeds and accelerations and number of cars and such. And this is too much data to talk about in 30 seconds. So let's just say in the training regime, everyone did quite well. The super risk neutral type of agent with their, their method isn't great. So let's pay attention to these, the more risk averse ones. These are risk neutral, non-distributional. These are risk neutral, distributional. But everyone's doing quite well, except for this ugly one right there. Now, when they really perturb the environment a lot, the risk averse policy gradient ones are still doing extremely well. The risk neutral non-distributional ones are suffering mightily. And this one lone distributional risk neutral one, I don't know why it's still doing well, but I don't, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns here. But the, the key point is that across the whole spectrum of as they vary the domain, the risk averse policies are the ones that were really able to transfer to those slightly out of domain settings. So I'm going to finish with this kind of research call because I think we have enough insight to already propose a next research step. So recall that distributional RL is a capturing a type of uncertainty called aleatoric uncertainty. That is the type of randomness that comes not only from the environment, but from your behavior and other agents in your environment's behavior. Uh, recall from search on the replay buffer that we can use distributional RL to give more robust value estimates that can be used downstream in a planner and that relies on such a learning process. And finally, that quantile QT opt, worst case policy gradients, these two works both showed that risk sensitivity can be used to improve transfer to slightly out of domain data. Maybe we can leverage this in, in a type of Monte Carlo tree search, but I'll focus for, for, for like a concrete proposal on trying to improve on mu zero since we had that presentation at the beginning. So here's my proposal. Let's replace the value bootstrap with a return distribution bootstrap. Why is that interesting? Well, it's just the first step, but it's interesting because the distribution in this case, if trained on the same data as the model, is actually capturing the same kind of uncertainty that your model with its different rollouts can capture. And what's, what the difference though is that the model, when we do a search on the model, we're doing, as, as Julian said, policy improvement. Whereas the distribution of returns doesn't have that. It still captures the uncertainty. It just doesn't have the ability to further improve its policy. Um, so the proposal to actually use these two things, this is in two ways. First, let's change the bonuses. These are already heuristics to encourage exploration. We can devise a heuristic that uses the return distribution to more intelligently explore the search tree. And the second one, is to vary the risk sensitivity of how we sample from these distributions as a function of the search depth. Specifically, that as we search deeper into these models, they're more and more likely to deviate in significant and not correct ways from the true, the true environment. And so acting in a more risk averse way can maybe improve our robustness in these types of deeper searches. Um, this is a slide just reminding you what mu zero's kind of overall architecture is. I'm saying replace this value function here in pink on the left with a distribution over returns, reminding you that you can train this distribution using the rollouts from the search themselves. And that this type of uncertainty will, will be kind of complementary with each other. And finally, that as we search deeper, a really interesting approach would be to actually sample from these distributions in a more risk averse way. Um, anyway, this is an interesting, I think, direction for research. Um, hopefully there's been some interesting connections to talk about. I'd like to highlight that there are some open source implementations of these distributional deep RL agents, in particular dopamine from Google Brain, and DeepMind just released a DQN Zoo that includes all of the distributional agents we've been working on, at like literally the exact same code that we, we use internally. Um, thank you very much. If I have any time for questions, I'll be happy to hear them. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you very much.